News about two lunar landers. Webb helps rule out one explanation for the Hubble tension. NASA's new quiet supersonic plane and lots of exoplanet news. All this and more in this week's Space Bites. Landing on the moon is tough. And we've learned this lesson time and time again with a mix of results of various missions attempting to land on the moon. And the one that we've been watching is the Astrobotic Peregrine lander, which was launched successfully by the first launch of Vulcan, but then subsequently has been leaking propellant and it wasn't going to be able to make a soft landing on the moon. In fact, it wasn't going to get close to the moon, crash into the moon, anything. It was going to be returning to Earth. And so on Thursday, the lander returned to Earth, crashed into the atmosphere roughly around New Zealand and is gone. And that sucks because there was going to be a bunch of really interesting science instruments and other stuff that they were going to be putting onto the moon. But more importantly, that this was going to be a commercial lander that you could just pay for a flight to the moon to put your science instruments on the surface of the moon and not have to worry about designing a rocket, designing a lander, all of that. So, but I mean, landing on the moon is tough. And this is the first attempt from Astrobotic. Hopefully, this will not be their last They will try again. And we will see a future where these landers are going on a regular basis. Now there is another mission that's landing on the moon. And that is Japan's smart lander for investigating the moon or slim, but it's been called the moon sniper. And the goal here is that it lands in a very targeted area on the moon. Just a quick update. I'm recording this just a few minutes after the slim lander made its successful landing on the moon, but there's a problem. It's solar panels aren't charging. And so it's not able to fill its battery back up. Now they've turned off the heating element to keep the batteries warm that will allow it to have a little bit longer battery life. It was able to deploy its two rovers onto the surface of the moon, although who knows how long it's going to be able to communicate with them. So this is all breaking unfolding. And obviously, we'll have a lot more news for you next week. So much exoplanet news. All right. Buckle up, we've got a lot of exoplanet news today. Three interesting stories. So first up, uh, let's talk about this world K218b. And you have probably heard of this world. This is that first example, possibly, of a Haitian world, a planet with a thick ocean of liquid water surrounded by a thick atmosphere of hydrogen. There were rumors of a very slight detection of a possible biosignature in the atmosphere, but it's such faint evidence that I really wouldn't count on it. But the planet was observed with the James Webb Space Telescope, and they were able to watch as it transited around its star. And then they were able to measure various chemicals in the atmosphere of this world. And based on the mix of chemicals that they saw in the atmosphere, this is why they're predicting that it is this Haitian world. But a paper came out this week that said, in fact, the mix of chemicals that they found in the atmosphere of this world, you could also get by it being covered in a thick layer of magma, that instead of it being a water world, it's a lava world, and that you would get the same mix of chemicals in the atmosphere. And one of the key chemicals that they were hoping to see was ammonia that you would get if you have a thick hydrogen atmosphere, you have water, you have other trace elements like nitrogen, you should get ammonia appearing in the atmosphere. And this wasn't seen. And the astronomers who published this other paper said, if it's covered in magma, then you wouldn't get that ammonia signal. And so that might be a good explanation. And like the point of this is just, it's so hard. It's so hard to know what it is that you're looking at with even the mighty James Webb Space Telescope. And it's going to take a long time for us to know with any certainty what it is that we're seeing. So just manage your expectations when you get these various announcements. I'm going to rant about this some more at the end of the episode. So stick around for that. But another planet is definitely covered in lava. Well, half of it is. The planet is orbiting a sun like star that is about 73 light years away. And so like that's in our relative backyard. I mean, all, there are tens of thousands of stars that are roughly that distance and closer. So but you could see this star with a pair of binoculars if you knew where to look. And the star is much younger than the sun. So even it has the same size as the sun. It is only about 400 million years old. Astronomers already knew of a couple of planets around this star and they found a new one. The planet orbits every 4.2 days and it's roughly the size of the Earth. So it's a hot Earth. 
It's so close that its surface temperature is over 1200 degrees Celsius, and it is almost certainly tidally locked to the star. And what's really interesting about this is that one half of the planet is so hot that it's just covered in lava. And then the other half is in eternal shadow. And so it is going to be solidified rock. And so you're going to have this weird yin yang planet, but it has half lava, half rock. One last piece of exoplanetary news. So astronomers have found another extreme exoplanet called WASP 69b. And this planet has been known for a little while, but astronomers were wondering what are the interactions between the star and the planet's atmosphere? There was like hints and evidence that there was a tenuous tail behind this planet. So they did follow on observations and they were able to detect this giant tail extending away from the planet. It goes about the same distance as the Earth to the moon. So like 400,000 ish kilometers, it just extends like this tail behind the planet as it orbits around the star. One of the big questions in astronomy is how these hot Jupiters can survive when they're that close to the star. They've got this radiation pressure, it should be blowing away the atmosphere should be changing the composition of the planet. And yet we find plenty of these hot Jupiters Did they migrate inward, and then they're getting their atmosphere blown off by the radiation from the star is the mass loss of this radiation just not enough. And so the stars can survive for long periods of time. Finding a planet that is actually undergoing this kind of atmospheric mass loss is really useful for building up models of how these various exoplanetary systems work. Every week, we do a vote on our channel where you tell us what you thought was the tastiest space bite. And this week, the winner was that Neptune isn't as blue as we thought. And you were heartbroken this week about that news. And so was I. And yet you understood that this was important and you voted. And uh, I, I gotta say, I, I agree with you on this one. Now we post this vote every week on the community tab of our channel. So if you want, you can go to the community tab, see the vote or just wait as you're scrolling through YouTube and you'll see the vote pop up. Give us a quick vote. Tell us what you think. The best chance for the YouTube algorithm to show you the poll is for you to be subscribed to our channel and click, click the notification bell Two giant arc like structures seen in space. This is one of the weirdest news stories that I've seen in a little while. Astronomers were scanning the sky, just doing a survey of the large scale structure of the universe, and they found these really interesting shapes in the sky. They are giant rings of galaxies. So one, the smaller one, they call it the big ring. And it's about 9.2 billion light years away. And it is billions of light years across. If you went outside, and you could see this ring, then it would be several times the size of the full moon in the sky. And then there's a second arc that's near that ring that is also sort of a similar scale, but like maybe it would trace out an even larger circle. And it's roughly the same distance away roughly at the same age of the universe. So what is it? Well, the largest scale structures that astronomers have found are much smaller than these structures are. So one possibility is that it's just a fluke that they just happen to be all of these galaxies in this shape. And there's no importance to it at all. But a more intriguing idea is that these are evidence of baryonic acoustic oscillations. So back at the early universe, when everything was incredibly hot and dense, you had sound waves moving through the early universe. And then those created regions of higher and lower density, which we can see in the cosmic microwave background radiation. And then as the universe started to cool and become less dense over time, what were sound waves turned into distributions of gas and dust turned into galaxy clusters on the larger scales. And so these could be examples of these baryonic acoustic oscillations. And if so, and if they can find more of them, it's a great way to be able to sort of roll back time in the universe. Now there are a couple of less mainstream ideas. So one is that these are evidence of cosmic strings and other possibilities that this is some kind of evidence of the previous universe before the Big Bang, like an echo from a previous time. But we will keep you updated as we get more information about this one fewer explanation for the Hubble tension. All right, we talk a lot about the Hubble tension here on the channel. And that's because it's like one of the most exciting things going on in cosmology right now. It's where you measure the expansion rate of the universe 
nearby, and then you measure the expansion rate of the universe at the earliest times in the universe, and you get two different numbers. Astronomers have been going over their observations again and again. What they found is that the error bars do not overlap, which means that there isn't some mistake in one measurement or the other. There's something weird going on. One possible explanation for this is known as Cepheid overcrowding. When astronomers measure distance in the universe at the closest level, they use this technique called astrometry. And that's, of course, what Guy is doing. You measure the angle to a star when the Earth is on one side of the sun, and then you measure it when it's on the other side of the sun, and then you use geometry to tell you the distance to that star. But astrometry only gets you so far within distances within the Milky Way. But another technique called Cepheid variables, and these are stars that pulsate on a very regular schedule. And the amount of the pulsation is directly tied to their intrinsic brightness. So you know how bright that star is. And so when you measure the pulsation rate of one of these stars, you know how bright it is. And so when you measure its brightness in the sky, you know how intrinsically bright it is. And that tells you how far away it is. And this technique was used by Hubble to measure the expansion rate of the universe like 100 years ago, but it's still being used today. This is one of the foundations of the distance ladder. And so astronomers need to be absolutely certain that this method is accurate, because if it isn't, then every other measurement that's based on it could be out of whack. And so one theory was that when you have these Cepheid variables that are in star clusters, and there's a lot of other stars around them, then the light that you're seeing from the Cepheid might not be as accurate because it's overcrowded by other stars. And so this is a worry when they were doing these observations with the Hubble Space Telescope. Well, now astronomers have used James Webb. And because it has infrared, it's able to see through that dust that could be overcrowding these Cepheid variables and really pick them out and make absolutely sure that it's got the brightness on them correct. And they found that the brightness of the Cepheids perfectly matches all of the measurements they've done before. And so this idea of Cepheid overcrowding has been ruled out. And so now you're left with all of the other possibilities to explain the Hubble tension. I'm going to be doing an interview with Adam Reese, who is one of the researchers behind this result. He's a Nobel Prize winner. And so it's going to be a fascinating conversation about how astronomers measure distance in the universe and the various techniques that they do it and how careful they are about this, as well as sort of like what impact James Webb has had. So stay tuned for that interview. Recently, I talked about how many stories Universe Today is publishing, both on the website, here on Space Bites, all of the interviews that we do, all the podcasts that we put out. But one of the things that I'm really proud about is how unique our coverage is. We dig deep. We read through science journals. We watch talks at conferences. We have an extensive list of contacts, people who give us scoops for stories. And I really try to make sure that the coverage that we've got on Universe Today is way beyond what you're going to find anywhere else. Sometimes like a quarter to a half the stories that you're going to find on Universe Today are completely unique to us. Now other people will report after we have, but I'm really proud of how well we get the news first. That's because we have a team. There's me, but there's also a whole bunch of people who write these stories and are able to do that research and contact the researchers and write original stories. And I have to pay their salaries. And the greatest help that we get is from our patron supporters. If you want to help create a truly independent space journalism team, join our Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash universe today. And the more support that we get, the more writers I can hire, the more producers, the more videos we can make, we invest it directly back into the content that we create. Shh. NASA shows us its new quiet supersonic plane. Why don't we have supersonic passenger aircraft? I mean, there was the Concorde, but it doesn't fly anymore. And there's a bunch of reasons. They're expensive, but also they're really loud. And so nobody wants supersonic jets flying overhead. But NASA has been working on a new type of supersonic airplane, one that they think is going to be quieter. And they contracted Lockheed Martin Skunk Works to build this plane. It's called the X-59. And this week, they rolled out the prototype of this new aircraft. And we're going to show you a bunch of pictures of it here. And it looks ridiculous. Like it's got this giant long nose and then a more traditional kind of fighter jet looking behind. And the purpose of that nose is to be able to 
cut through the air and try to smooth out what would be a really loud sonic boom. It works in theory, but now there's an actual practical prototype that's going to be doing some flights and their plan is they're going to fly this thing around over the US at supersonic speeds and then survey people on the ground to say like, how loud did you find that aircraft as it flew overhead? And if it works, then we might see supersonic airplanes that could fly twice the speed of existing passenger aircraft. And so you could reduce your flight times. It would be pretty cool if they could figure this out. The Milky Way's magnetic fields in 3D. The Milky Way is filled with magnetic fields. And like we know that there are magnetic fields around various planets and various stars, but in fact, just the interstellar gas, the plasma around all of the regions of the Milky Way has a magnetic field. And so astronomers have been able to map the magnetic field of the Milky Way. Now the way they do it is they measure the photons that are coming from this gas and they check to see its polarization. And the polarization gives you an indication of the direction of the magnetic field. And what they found was that the magnetic field of the Milky Way doesn't match necessarily the orientation of the gas and the structures in the Milky Way. But it does line up quite nicely with the spiral arms of the Milky Way, especially where you've got regions of star formation. And so this is a big question, like what impact does the magnetic field lines of the Milky Way contribute to the amount of star formation? And can we see this in other galaxies as well? Now I want to talk a bit more about how difficult it is to observe exoplanets. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Hey Twyla, Dougie Stewart, Stephen Krasaki, David Richards, Mark Ansis, Joel Yancey, Antonio Lofi Lara, Dustin Cable, Vlad Shipland, Modso, George, David Gilton, Andrew Gross, Jeremy Mattern, Josh Schultz, and Jordan Young, who support us at the Master of the Universe level, and all of our other supporters on Patreon. So earlier in this episode, I talked about how what you might have is a Haitian world, or you might have a world that's covered in lava, that it's two different kinds of fluid, <laughs> fluid water, fluid rock, and how difficult it is to even tell the difference of it. And like, I get the comment all the time that people were hoping to see more from the James Webb Space Telescope. And even though this telescope is like seven times the collecting area of the Hubble Space Telescope, it's about 50 times more sensitive than the Hubble Space Telescope is the most powerful telescope that humanity has ever built and put into space. It is still not able to do the impossible. And the impossible is resolving exoplanets with the kind of detail that I know people were hoping for. They want to see mountains and trees and oceans and cities. They want to watch aliens reading newspapers as they go about their daily lives. And we don't get that. You get one pixel if you're lucky. And from that you do spectroscopy to determine the presence of chemicals in the atmosphere of that planet. And it's really hard to know how much of those chemicals are in the atmosphere of that planet. And it's really hard to detect chemicals that are very faint in that atmosphere of that planet. And so you should be prepared for this kind of uncertainty all the time that when you hear an announcement that some chemical is found in the atmosphere of a planet, you're going to want to say, how many sigma? Is it a five sigma detection, something that is considered rock solid by the astronomical community? Is it a one sigma detection, which, you know, there's a random chance that it's actually there? You want to look into that. And like I said, you want to prepare yourself for the reality that the planet sucks, not that it is a beautiful home for life. And the problem, of course, is that you're going to see a lot of news stories out there that are going to go towards the more bombastic headline. And then they will be quiet later on when more information comes out and we have a much better sense about what's going on. I will try to temper myself and try to help you manage your expectations as we move forward as we find these things. And especially when it comes to life to biosignatures. Have we found life on another planet? Oh, it's going to be such a hard result to actually say with certainty that you found life. Like unless we detect a signal coming from aliens directed at us. It's really hard to know for sure. So just Enjoy the process, enjoy the ongoing discovery, and don't get too worried about whether or not we found life and when we're going to find it. It's going to take time. All right, we'll see you next week.